This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Hopsteiner, a global leader in the hop industry focused on quality, sustainability, and innovation in new hop varieties and hop products. Contact our brewery sales team to provide you with the hop-related tools you need to craft your next great beer. For more information, visit hopsteiner.com. Additional support provided by... Draft Lab knows that quality and consistency are your brewery's top priorities. Draft Lab provides easy-to-use sensory analysis tools designed to bring your tasting data into action. To start your free two-week trial today, visit draftlab.com. That's D-R-A-U-G-H-T Lab. Dot com. The haze is acting as a carrier and it's solubilizing uh, some of these nonpolar hop compounds that you would find at much lower concentrations uh, in a West Coast IPA. This week on the show, the hidden secrets of New England IPA with Dr. John Paul May. John Paul, it was good to see you a few weeks ago at the Brewing Summit. As usual, you walked away with some awards, this time best presentation, both from the technical committee as well as people's choice. So congrats again on that. Thank you. You presented an impressive analysis of New England IPAs. How did this all come about? Well, I'm originally from New England. I was born and raised in Connecticut. And uh, about three years ago, I was at a Master Brewers local in Leesburg, and people started talking about New England IPAs. And I was like, what's that? You know, and I was surprised I hadn't heard of it before. And anyways, uh, they started describing it as being really cloudy and hazy and uh, a lot of hop flavor, but not very bitter. And given the work we had done in dry hopping, I had a feeling I knew what the, uh, you know, was causing the, let's say, the the not very bitter part. Uh, But the, uh, the haze made me think, maybe it was like solubilizing stuff that you might not expect in beer. And so uh, that's kind of how we got started on this. I guess before we get too far, we should at least give an overview of the beer style. What exactly makes a New England IPA a New England IPA? Well, primarily, um, uh, it's it's the grain bill and also uh, how the hops are used. So typically, um, these beers uh, use either 10% up to 50% of a high protein adjunct like oats or wheat. And oats and wheat uh, contain uh, the proteins in oats and wheat, uh, about 80% of them are prolamines. And prolamines are haze potential proteins. And so um, this is why like wheat beers are hazy. Uh, The prolamines uh, in wheat or, or oats can complex with polyphenols uh, to form these haze-forming complexes. Uh, However, with wheat beers, usually they're hazy also because they contain a lot of yeast. A lot of the wheat beers are bottle-conditioned, whereas these uh, New England IPAs are not. Uh, But in any event, so we thought it might be a combination of yeast as well as uh, these uh, prolamine polyphenol complexes. And and then how the hops are used are also very unique. Um, Generally, little to no hops are added to the brew kettle. And uh, there's usually a whirlpool addition. And then uh, the dry hopping actually s- usually starts to take place about 24 hours to 48 hours after you pitch the yeast. So the hops are actually added during active fermentation. And a lot of times they'll add the hops like maybe like a one pound per day for the first three or four days. And so a lot of these craft brewers who are making these New England IPAs are adding as much as three to four pounds of hops per barrel, just in the fermenter. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to talk a little bit more about those multiple dry hop additions? When and, and, I mean, you've already covered when, but what's the logic behind doing so many of them? 
Yeah, well, what they're trying to do, I believe, is um, take advantage of uh, the biotransformation that can take place during fermentation. Uh, it's There's been some pretty good papers written in the literature which talk about how the oxygenated hop oils like geranol and linalool can be uh, transformed by the yeast while the yeast are actively fermenting. And actually, this is a project uh, we're just starting some work on, is we wanted to see, does it make sense to try to add all three or four pounds at once initially, or does it make sense to add them in charges? And I guess the thought process is, maybe if you add it all initially, uh, all that CO2 that's very that's blowing off during fermentation, maybe you blow off a lot of your oil. So maybe to, to spoon feed the yeast, let's say, those oils slowly over time, they do these multiple additions. So that way, you know, some of that oil does get blown off, but not all of it. And then they hit it with a fresh charge of oil, and then the yeast can metabolize it. And a lot of those compounds that are transformed by the yeast turn out to be uh, floral and fruity in nature. And that's what a lot of people say when they try these beers. They can sometimes actually taste quite, quite fruity or even juicy. You've got a rather large database of West Coast IPAs. Talk about how you leveraged that database for this project and what you wanted to uncover. Yeah, what we wanted to do was uh, compare, you know, the hop compounds that are found uh, typically in a West Coast style IPA like alpha acids, isoalpha acids, uh, humulinones, uh, beta acids, uh, and xanthohumol, and uh, as well as mercine. We look at mercine too sometimes, and we wanted to see how it would vary with these uh, uh, beers. Uh, one of the things I kind of was hoping to see, and we actually did see it, was that um, we would see higher concentrations of xanthohumol, which is a polyphenol uh, that's uniquely found in hops. And most West Coast IPAs only contain about 0.7, maybe 0.75%. It seems to be the saturation limit. Uh, but with these New England IPAs, we had some beers that contained as much as four parts per million. So uh, quite a bit higher. Let's walk through uh, all the different various analyses you ran and see what jumps out. Let's um, let's start with the iso alpha acids. Yeah, the iso content in these beers um, were, were in general lower in concentration uh, than a West Coast style IPA. So, for an example, uh, the average uh, concentration uh, for these um, uh, New England IPAs was around 20 ppm, whereas with a West Coast IPA, we were measuring 48 parts per million. And and the range of ISO uh, was about 5 ppm to 32 ppm, but uh, the average was 20. Uh, how about humulinones? How did that work out? Yeah, the, the humulinone uh, range was uh, 12 ppm to 38, with the average being 26, whereas uh, with the West Coast IPA, it was about 11 ppm. And again, it, it kind of makes sense because they're, uh, they're not adding a lot of hops in the kettle, so you would expect the ISO concentration to be lower. And because of the huge amount of hops they're adding uh, in the fermenter, like three to four pounds, uh, they're getting a lot of that humulinone to dissolve in. Uh, uh, as, you, as you may have known from the previous work we did on dry hopping, uh, uh, humulinones are about 66% as bitter as isoalpha acids. And they also contribute a kind of a smooth, non-lingering bitterness. And uh, what's interesting about these hop acids is they're extremely soluble in beer. You know, at a one pound per barrel dose rate, you can get over 95% of the humulinone dissolving into the beer. And with each pound afterwards, the utilization drops a little bit, but still you can get, you know, a significant amount of humulinone even with three or four pounds uh, per barrel. Okay, great. And how about alpha acids? Yeah, this was kind of interesting. Um, the alpha concentration in these beers uh, were quite a bit higher than in West Coast IPA. Uh, West Coast IPA, typically we see about 13 ppm as the average, uh, whereas with uh, these New England IPAs, the low end was 17, and we had one beer that had as much as 72 parts per million, with the average being uh, about 31 ppm. So we had almost three times as much alpha in these beers than in a typical West Coast IPA. So I'm sure that was a little bit of a surprise, but the biggest surprise came when you looked at beta acids. What happened there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you generally don't see beta acid in beer. I mean, it's it, you can't even find it in most beers. Uh, uh, some uh, Hefeweiss beers in Germany, uh, we measured maybe as little as a half a ppm to one ppm. And with these beers, uh, the, the low end was one ppm. 
all the way up to 14 ppm with the average being five. Wow. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, you said you looked at myrcene as well, and that was pretty high too, right? Yeah, the, the range on myrcene was a uh, half a part per million up to two and a half with the average being 1.4. Whereas most West Coast IPAs, the, the mercine concentration is below 0.3. Okay. And what's next? Yeah, we also looked at the Xanthahumol. And uh, again, the range there was 0.9 to 3.5, with the average being 2. Whereas uh, West Coast IPAs, usually the maximum is about 0.7 ppm. So we had a lot more mercine. Coming up. So that told us if you remove the haze, you're going to remove a lot of these nonpolar hop compounds. So we felt pretty comfortable that the haze was acting as a kind of like an emulsifier and keeping these things uh, in solution where otherwise they wouldn't be. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Barna Mechanical, a full-service design build firm specializing in turnkey process and utility systems for the brewing industry. We partner with some of the best craft brewers in the U.S. to ensure the great beer they brew is what their customers get in every glass, bottle, can, or keg. You know beer. We know breweries. Additional support provided by... ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, tri-clamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. The St. Louis Annual Golf Tournament is September 20th. District Milwaukee meets at City Lights Brewing September 20th. District Pittsburgh has their fall meeting at Mindful Brewing September 24th. The 2018 District Ontario Iron Brewer September 28th. District Southern California meets in San Diego September 29th. Founders Brewing is hosting the Master Brewers HACCP Course in Grand Rapids October 1st and 2nd. The District Northwest Fall Meeting is in Yakima October 12th and 13th. Don't miss the Can Seeming Webinar October 19th. District Philly meets October 19th and 20th. And the Master Brewers two-week Brewing and Malting Science course begins in Madison October 21st. View the full calendar of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. We know from the previous work that you mentioned, which we also discussed way back on episode four, that running beers like these through the standard IBU test would give us garbage numbers. Tell us how you approached analyzing bitterness for these beers. Yeah, what we did is um, we use a high performance liquid chromatography, which is a a very good instrument uh, that uh, you can literally inject the beer into into the machine. And as the beer passes through this specialized column, the column separates the various hop compounds based on polarity. So we can separate out the isoalpha acids uh, from the alpha acids and from the humulinones. And those are the three uh, real bitter compounds that are in beer and or in these beers. And then what we did is uh, we took those concentrations and then we multiplied them by their relative bitterness relative to isoalpha acids. So alpha has been reported to be about one tenth as bitter. So if we have 10 ppm of alpha, That means we're getting, let's say, one ppm of, let's say, ISO intensity bitterness. Same thing with humulinones. If we had 10 ppm of humulinone, uh, it's 66% is bitter. So that means it would contribute about 6.6 ppm of, let's say, ISO intensity bitterness. And then we add up the ppm of isoalpha acids. And so we can calculate the bitterness. And generally what we find is that the calculated bitterness is about half, maybe a little bit more than half of what the IBU test result is. And that's a more realistic estimate of where the bitterness is going to come. You also looked at foam. How did foam stability of New England IPA stack up against the the West Coast IPAs? In general, they were much better. And again, uh, 
the the reason for that uh, is uh, again there is a lot more protein in these in these beers uh, from using these high protein uh, uh, you know oats and wheat. And the other thing is um, uh, there's a lot of alpha acids in these beers. And alpha acid is actually a very good foam enhancer. Uh, a lot of people don't think of alpha as being you know uh, foam enhancing, but it, it actually is, quite is. And and like I said, when you have some beers. You know, with these beers ranging from 17 ppm up to you know 70, uh, yeah, the foam on these beers, as a general rule, was were very good. You analyzed haze, which seems like a pretty good idea. These uh, are very turbid beers. Before we talk about what's in that haze, tell us what's not in it. What's not in it was a, a pretty big surprise uh, for us. Uh, is actually uh, yeast. Um, there was only one beer that had a yeast count of five million. And virtually everything else was below 1 million. And if you take a 1 million yeast count per mil and you run haze on it, it's like less than five. So it's it's very, very low. So the yeast was not a major uh, contributor to haze, especially when we ran the turbidity on these beers. The turbidity ranged from 80 to 900 NTUs, with the average being just under 300. Whereas with West Coast IPAs, uh, the turbidity was typically uh, 80 uh, NTUs, if not less. You wanted to verify that the turbidity was responsible for trapping all of these nonpolar hop compounds. How did you go about doing that? Yeah, what we did is um, it was a good idea from uh, one of my colleagues, Bob Smith, who did all this work for us in the lab. Uh, But essentially what we did is we took a couple of these beers and um, we put them in a centrifuge. And uh, by spinning them down, we were able to uh, reduce the haze and in one case, almost completely eliminate it. And when we did that, uh, we then looked at the concentration of the various hop compounds like humulinones, isoalpha acids, alpha acids, myrcene, azantahumol, and beta acids. Now, the, uh, when we reduced the haze from centrifuging, the change in humulinone and isoalpha acid concentration was almost non-existent. Uh, so that told us that the haze was not, uh, let's say, solubilizing these uh, these polar hop compounds. But the more non-polar hop compounds, like alpha acid, myrcene, uh, xanthohumol, and beta acids, when we centrifuged, when we looked at the concentration of those compounds, uh, the alphas essentially dropped in half. Uh, the myrcene dropped by like almost two-thirds. Uh, the xanthohumol dropped in half, and uh, and the beta acids uh, dropped down significantly to almost nothing. So, um, yeah, the um, so that told us if you remove the haze, you're going to remove a lot of these nonpolar hop compounds. So we felt pretty comfortable that the haze was acting as a kind of like an emulsifier and keeping these things uh, in solution where otherwise they wouldn't be. You even freeze dried and analyzed the haze uh, precipitation. What did that uncover? Yeah, uh, by removing all the moisture, uh, we were able to have the uh, the precipitate uh, tested uh, for protein. And as we expected, uh, it did contain thirty five and a half percent protein. Uh, we also tested the haze for polyphenols. And again, uh, we know that these haze forming compounds are generally a mixture of protein and polyphenols. And that's what we found. We found about three and a half percent polyphenols. And then also, uh, to our surprise, we, we saw about point, uh, almost one percent fatty acids uh, in that haze uh, precipitate. And then we also analyzed for the hop compounds, and uh, it contained point one percent myrcene, eight percent alpha acids, three uh, percent beta acids, point three percent xanthohumol, and then point three percent iso and point two percent humulinones. So, um, yeah, the, uh, the haze uh, is, again, kind of like what the literature suggests. It's a protein complex with polyphenols, but these other hop compounds also uh, are part of that haze complex and do impart a small amount of haze to the beer. We calculated that to be about maybe 10 to 15 percent of the haze is coming from the hop acids or these hop compounds. It's probably too early for you to say, but do you have any sense of, you know, just how much haze is needed to trap these compounds or to what extent it matters if it's 35% protein versus 25, et cetera? No, we really haven't looked at that. And, uh, and again, there was quite a range in the uh, amount of haze in these beers. And so uh, uh, we might 
look at that in the future. Uh, but I suspect just the lighter the haze uh, reading on these beers, the less protein. And then, of course, the other thing we found, too, was there was actually a pretty good correlation between uh, and a linear cor- correlation between the haze uh, in, in the beer and the concentration of myrcene and xanthal humol. Uh, it wasn't linear with beta acids, but it, it, there was definitely a correlation as well that the higher the haze, the more beta acids we got in the beer. But um, but it, w- it wasn't linear, but it, it definitely, the higher the haze, the more beta. Okay, so since you found that relationship between turbidity and concentration of nonpolar hop compounds, I'm just curious, in your opinion, were the hazier beers better from a sensory standpoint? You know, we didn't uh, uh, test the beers for taste, uh, so we didn't do any sensory on these beers. You also looked at the stability of that haze. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, and this is an issue with, I think, a lot of beers, whether it's uh, Hefeweiss or, or these New England IPAs, and that is the, the haze isn't very stable and will eventually drop out over time. We, we were very fortunate. Uh, we got almost all of our New England IPA beers fresh from the brewery. Uh, we told them as soon as the beer is packaged to ship them to us, and, uh, and they sh- shipped us quite a bit of beer because we were able to uh, run on quite a few tests, and we ran the haze over the course of six months, but usually within the first month or two, uh, you could lose as much as 80 or 90% of your haze. So, um, um, again, uh, that's just, that's normal that you find that even in wheat beers and, and what some of the craft brewers I was told are doing when they brew up these hazy New England IPAs is they, uh, pack, you know, they ship the kegs upside down. <laughs> so that way, when the, the bar gets them, they flip them upright and that'll help you know, draw the haze back into the beer. Yeah. That's an old trick that with wheat beers that people have been doing for a long time. So yeah. do you know, do you know whether or not any of these beers uh, had any type of additives to, to try to attempt to stabilize the haze, for example, like a tannic acid or something like that? I, ha- I hadn't heard that. Um, but I know a lot of people are trying to do tricks. I've heard of some people actually adding like flour, like wheat flour, like into the whirlpool. And, and maybe what they're trying to do there is, um, again, you might be getting some protein in that way, um, but uh, maybe they're trying to get some of the starch because starch and beer can also cause it to be a little hazy. So I've heard of some people doing that. Do you have any advice of how you might be able to stabilize haze like that? Well, not really. Um, we did a project with a craft brewer uh, a while back on trying to make a stable wheat beer. And one of the things we did is um, we uh, found that you could add beta acids uh, to the beer and make it hazy, but it was really important that the beer not contain anything, like no uh, yeast or anything. So you, what you're really starting off of is a crystal clear beer, and then you can add the beta. And it made a, a very stable haze, but like I said, um, it wasn't as hazy as some of these New England IPAs. I mean, they, it was a much lighter in haze. Very good. Any final thoughts? I think that, like I said, the big takeaway here is that the, um, you know, the, the haze is acting as a carrier and it's solubilizing uh, some of these nonpolar hop compounds that you would find at much lower concentrations uh, in a West Coast IPA uh, or not at all in the case of beta acid. So it is definitely acting as a carrier and uh, keeping a lot of these compounds uh, in, in, in solution. Nice work. Well, thanks for uncovering that mystery for us, and we'll have to have you back on the show uh, again before another 100 episodes go by, I think. (laughs) All right. Very good. All right. That was John Paul May here on the Master Brewers Podcast. If you'd like to see the data from John Paul's presentation at the 2018 Brewing Summit, look for the conference proceedings, which will soon be available at mbaa.com slash store. Did you enjoy today's episode? Would you like us to keep making more? If so, there's a really simple way you can let us know. Subscribe, rate, and review the Master Brewers podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And then I fought on the ground Just like that one day, like everyone else did